Hi everybody. Hello. We are about to start the Friday Lightning Talks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, our, let's uh, have a show of hands. How many of us are Hackathon members? Good. Uh, welcome Hackathon members and for the non-members, uh, welcome also to you. Uh, Hackatojo happens to be one of the largest uh, community slash co-working spaces in the world. Uh, unbelievable people. We also have free coffee. <laughs> um, the lightning talks have been a Hackatojo tradition for over a year now. Every Friday we meet, we have four speakers, um, five minute presentations, even though time seems to be relative uh, when the speakers get on stage. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Gurley. Gurley, if you could set up, please. Now, here's a joke. One uh, person who applied to be a cop at a police academy was asked, what would you do if you had to arrest your mother? And any ideas what he said? He said, I'm going to call for backup. <laughs> Gurley stunned his son. Actually, uh, her son started a startup called Udon. Yes, as in the noodles. She fired her son. And Udon is actually like an online comic con which is always on. Gali, tell us more. Okay. <coughs> While she's setting up, do you guys know Burning Man is happening right now? Yes. Now what is for some of us, yes, it's a perpetual burn. Now, what is the difference between a hippie and a burner? People who go to the burning man are called burners. It's a $800 ticket. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gurley. I'm the founder of Udon, the Never Ending Comic Con. And um, it's for people who are interested in comic books, video games, tabletop games, anime, cosplay, all that nerdy stuff that used to be marginalized but is now actually quite mainstream. Um, this actually, I didn't want to show you this right now, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, it started out, um, as Sophie said, as a mom and son team, and um, we did a bunch of market research uh, at Comic Cons across the country and found that at the heart of um, Geeks Everywhere is community. And so we built a platform that. Uh, address the behaviors of that community, and that's um, creating, sharing, consuming content, buying and selling um, nerdy stuff, and uh, connecting and engaging with others who share the same passions. Um, so Mary Meeker of Kleiner Perkins uh, called the three C's, uh, community content and commerce, um, the internet trifecta. So we know we're on the right track. Um, anyway, so what is Udon about? It's a content and commerce platform for pop culture nerds. And um, we just finished our MVP, and this is all like bogus content right now, but, um, and it's gonna be cleaned up. I mean, the UI, uh, UX is kind of messy, and we're working um, through a round of bugs, but I did wanna kind of get your feedback and share with you um, some of the features. So uh, anyway, it's a content and commerce platform. So let's say you're a cosplayer, and um, you, uh, you have blog posts and podcasts and, and uh, YouTube videos and images on Imgur. You have all this content fragmented um, across the internet. We aggregate it all uh, onto your identity page and give you the ability to sell. Sell your, your product, merchandise, um, swag. And um, it's not just for geeky creators or, uh, or um, geek industry professionals, but also professional sellers too, like comic book shops, um, convention vendors. They can upload their merchandise. Uh, and also add multimedia content to help connect them to users. Like, let's say you're a comic book shop in Seattle and you've got you know, all your merchandise on, but you also have comic book rating tutorials or unboxings or videos of your inventory. People from an, uh, that other part of the country or world can you know, start following you and getting connected to you and, and develop a relationship. Um, or let's say you're just an everyday nerd. Maybe you don't create a lot of content, but you consume it. Um, and maybe you want to sell your personal lightsaber collection or whatever. Um, we just uh, take content and commerce and we give it context and focus on community. Um, and so anyway, like I said, kind of ugly right now, but this, 
this section right here is where we can curate um, content and, and people that we like that are new to our site or whatever, we can kind of highlight what's going on. Um, it's uh, filter-based, so filtered based on um, interests, so comics, uh, video games. You know, you can select the things that, you, that you're interested in, and let's say you just want to buy stuff. Um, you can select merchandise. I mean, like I said, this, all this is bogus content right now. Um, let's say you want to add, uh, I'm Modus. Um, I want to add, let's say, something from Imager, and I'm going to, But just in the interest of time, I'm just going to throw this stuff, you know, based on category, and, you know, you can throw in some tags, whatever. Um, and what, what shows up is, you know, your piece of content that still gets the viewership um, on your original site. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So anyway, we aggregate multimedia content, so your SoundCloud, 8-bit um, music, your, um, your merchandise, your uh, um, YouTube videos, blog posts, all that nerdy fragmented stuff that's on the internet onto your identity page, and then you can sell from there. And as a consumer, you can follow other, we call them a matrix, uh, your identity page because it's a matrix of content and commerce. You can follow other matrices too that you find interesting or you can follow tags too. So you can just add the tags here and anything that's tagged that gets um, uh, funneled into your feed and so you consume the content that you're interested in. Uh, right now we're e-commerce uh, based. We just finished our MVP so kind of like I said working out the bugs um, and we should be launching to our private beta users in the next week or so and a week or two and then once we load the site with content and commerce in a private setting, then we'll open it up to the public, um, hopefully by October 1st. So uh, bootstrap so far, we want to get some traction, and then um, we'll start pitching for our seed round. Thank you so much. Questions, anybody? merchandise, content, is original content. I mean, cosplay stuff is, is different. I mean, that's, that's you know, uh, not in the same realm, but, but there are issues with um, copyright infringement, and there are issues with, um, like, licensing, things like that. We'll probably deal with that when we have, you know, attorneys and stuff, but we're going to be grassroots for a while, community-based, and um, we'll have that kind of provision that people who upload content, um, you know, should be original content. Mm -hmm. Once you've built this platform, would it have applications to other interest groups? Yeah, absolutely. So we, what we're doing is kind of vetting this content community and commerce um, approach uh, with a really passionate um, uh, community, and uh, that that where content and commerce makes sense, where there is already that behavior going on in this particular community. So we're going to vet it this way, and then. Um, maybe white label it and, and, and take a look at other uh, communities where content and commerce go hand in hand. Right. Sports, even like even um, fitness actually, so bodybuilder.com is a, is, a, is a big one, but there's like user generated content as well, there's commerce. Multi-vendor multi commerce where people sell things um, and user generated content even though the user doesn't necessarily have to be uh, an amateur, it could be a, a video game manufacturer, or you know, eventually like Disney. One day we'd like to have Disney just as a ha as a presence on our site. We can create their own matrix and you know alert their fans on our site uh, about what they're doing. They might probably won't sell anything, but um, we hope to be like the nerd hub for you know uh, for the broad spectrum of nerdism. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, this is focused. So Reddit is absolutely it's about community, and, and there are a bunch of subreddits. We're integrating um, the commerce component uh, um, as well. So it's it's really about like um, a dedicated community, even though it's broad spectrum. You know, like whatever uh, comic books, video games, table talk, all that stuff. A lot of people have overlapping interests anyway. Reddit is is it's all about community. There really isn't a commerce component um, to that, and um, and they just take everybody off site. We have to start that way, but one day, you know, we see ourselves as, as hosting media as well. So it's never going to replace like. With them. <laughs> well, well, Reddit is. Um, I mean, it, it it it's about community, but it's it's we we want people to you know sort of create an identity, and have all the other media. Up attached your identity and give you the ability to sell to. So there are probably some people that, that you know, can be on Reddit and all the various subreddits that they're interested in, but also, you know, go to our site as well for just nerdy stuff, though. yeah. Just to focus on uh, pop culture. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Billy. One of us is an editor, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, we have with us today the Head of Entrepreneurship uh, from Bond University, Australia. If you could set up please, Baden. Uh, he's actually visiting on a week-long study tour with seven of his students. And uh, Baden also has his own startup. He's in the agricultural space where he's uh, working to bring increased margins to farmers. How is it going, mate? Right? <laughs> wonderful, thank you, Sophie. Okay. You have the mic, Baden. Hello, or good day, one of the two. We'll bring this up. Uh, as Soph said so eloquently, uh, I do have a startup on the go, and uh, it's in the ag space. We put a handheld spectrometer, uh, attach it to a smart device, chuck it to a cloud-based algorithm, and then deliver uh, moisture and protein analysis on a smart device for farmers, so on farm they can measure quality of grain uh, in order to, to get to the market and reduce the reliance on the middleman. Uh, that's the interest on the side. My main gig is uh, in entrepreneurship education at Bond University where Australia's only private not-for-profit university and we have a big focus on entrepreneurship education. Uh, one of our big uh, focus points is the employability of our graduates and we're looking for different ways to be able to enhance the employability of our graduates. And that's for a really big reason, because these days is a very tough job market for 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, in the US you see figures in excess of 10%, Australia a little bit worse. EU region, as, as an average, 22.5% of 18 to 25 year olds are not obtaining full time work. Um, when you look, Spain, excess of 60%. In the Australian edition, the, the story is even worse. Of those who are unemployed, the long-term unemployed is also increasing drastically. That's those who are unemployed for longer than 12 months. You can see almost reaching 20% now in Australia of the unemployed between 18 and 25. This is a significant problem. It's a significant workforce problem. It's a significant uh, society problem. And we're looking at ways of being able to solve it. And one of the ways it's being bandied around at the moment is supporting startups. And there's good reason behind that. The OECD did a bunch of research on job creation and job destruction and where the net job creation is coming from. Uh, and it shows that young, innovative firms are the major creators of jobs in our economy, as opposed to large, old firms, which are major destroyers and loss of jobs. Uh, recent work by Stanford professor George Foster has done some increased analysis on this and we see that the job creation within startups is especially great in the first few years and tends to decline over time. Years three, four and five, we can see that kind of the annual job destruction you know, starting to overtake. Still net, still net positive, but there's work to be done on, on assisting startups to continue employment through the growth of, of their organisation. This has led to policy decisions. This is a, a grab out of the Queensland state government. We were in the state of Queensland, Australia. There's also a federal position in this place that is putting a focus on emphasis behind supporting startups. Lots of research grants, lots of startup grants, talent 
attraction and retention grants. Uh, in terms of Australia, we're looking to grow the percentage of GDP. Currently, 0.1 of a percent of Australia's GDP is driven by startups. Uh, we're looking to bring that up to 4%, uh, increasing up to 110 billion. The government is looking for startups to drive employment. Uh, you see similar things happening here in, in the United States. One of the ways they're doing that is to encourage STEM education. You've probably heard STEM. Yeah, bandied around is one of these great terms. It's a very, very noble and worthwhile initiative uh, focusing on developing science, technology, technology, engineering and mathematical skills amongst our graduates. The, the growth, the grassroots skills that are required to be able to go out in the workforce and be productive um, uh, elements of our workforce. A recent piece of study that was done by CEDA, which is the Committee for Economic Development for Australia, is looking into what the future workforce will look like. What are the skills that are needed? And the number one outcome that came is the, the jobs that will thrive in the future are those where you creatively apply technology to problems. And I'll just reinforce that point. The jobs that will thrive will be where you creatively apply technology to problems. Jobs that can be automated and we were down at uh, Boot Up World uh, in earlier in the week experiencing this space. The receptionist was a robot, right? If, if things can be automated, they will. What can't be automated is the creative application of technology to problems. And that's where STEM comes in. But it also needs to be complemented with creativity, complex problem solving and emotional intelligence. And when we do a bunch of research on C-level executives across the United States, huge emphasis saying we need, amongst our graduates, experiential learning and entrepreneurship education. So I'm starting a movement tonight. Actually, I started it last week. Uh, it's the movement of STEAM and not STEM. There needs to be the combination of entrepreneurship education to be able to commercialise the great stuff that comes out of our technical founders. That's me. To begin this process, it's all about community. So... Link up. I'd love to have a bit of a chat. Thanks for your time this evening. I'd love to target any questions. Thank you, and it's a great insight because uh, John Deere actually have a, a bunch of IP related to the capture and of data with respect to the transference of data. Uh, Case IH are uh, just recently announcing putting on harvester analysis tools so farmers can see on harvester. Uh, we're playing at a different end of the market in the sense that not everyone can afford the top end harvesting equipment, uh, and there's a, a large portion of a relatively segmented um, farming community that can do with a very inexpensive way of being able to test grain. Uh, our, our unit will cost a couple hundred bucks plus a monthly service fee to have access to the, to the, to the back-end management solution. And there's a couple of other added advantages. Uh, the analysis on farm allows you to blend between different silos to meet exact requirements for, for selling to market. Uh, increasing margins for farmers. It also helps to get past all the shenanigans that happens at the port where the bulk handlers try and really do one over on the farmers and the farmers are doing smart things by putting really high quality grain on the top and having the, the cheap stuff underneath. Dry. All that stuff happens at the transaction. So a quick little device can get past a lot of that that happens. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I get asked this question and uh, my position is actually assistant professor of entrepreneurship and so Therefore, we must be able to, right? <laughs> because I exist. Yeah. The argument is we don't teach people how to be entrepreneurs. What we teach is the entrepreneurial method and, and to bring it back to a set of uh, uh, attributes that define the way of thinking, reasoning and acting that is the entrepreneurial behaviour. Yeah, and there's some, some theoretical views that show five different attributes. And the argument goes, uh, if you can identify the attributes, you can find out how to assess them, you can actually build that capability in individuals. 
transferring entrepreneurial knowledge into entrepreneurial intentions into organisational outcomes. Um, and then, then the really tricky thing is converting that into organisational capabilities. Yeah? And, and you do that in a range of different ways. One of the ways is through ex experiential education, like what we're doing here with our study tour, bringing seven students to sort of absorb the mecca of innovation around the world, you know? Yeah. Thank you. What do you use to scale that impact presentation? Uh, say again, sorry? What, what do you use to try to scale that impact in your area? Yeah, um, you got my Twitter feed there and chuck a hashtag with a steam on it. <laughs> right? Um, the more people that understand it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's emerging as a priority. Uh, you see it coming through that, that, that uh, information that I, oh, right, wrong way, information that I put up before it is, comes out of Northeastern University. Uh, C-suite executives across the United States calling for entrepreneurship education. It's being put out there and a lot of effort's being put in. Um, it, you know, entrepreneurship education has been around for a long time and it's really increasing in its, in its uh, importance in the delivery of both business programs but also across campus. We might leave it there. Oh, one last one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Bond University is a is a small private uh, university. We have class size average of about twelve and a half to one, twelve and a half students to every academic faculty member. We have a really high touch, uh, personalised approach to education uh, that gives access. Like Hugh, hey, um, one of my students. We know one another, you know, by name. You can call me on the weekends. There's that, there's that high touch. So Bond's particular positioning in the market is the student experience. We provide a really boutique, high touch, high level uh, student experience, which our competitors in the Australian market simply cannot, cannot replicate because they're, they're, they're running a different business model. Different story in the United States. Yeah, we, our business school is most likened to Dartmouth over in, um, up in New Hampshire. Um, they're our most common competitor or, you know, uh, well, not competitor, we don't compete, but the person by which we are, uh, are sort of recognised. So that exists over here, right? Um, different. Australia's a small market, 23 million people. Thank you, Lisa. I've always been curious on just teaching entrepreneurship, so like some common elements are like passion and hunger and perseverance. And these are like words that you can say in a textbook and say, well, yeah, I can be passionate and yeah, I can be hungry and yeah, I can be persistent, but like, you like live it. <laughs> right. Um, you know, you're not really an entrepreneur. Yeah, so uh, what you're describing is called the trait based view of entrepreneurship, and it looks at what defines an entrepreneur and its passion and its hunger and its determination and its, yeah, these factors. That was a view that was kind of brought out in the 70s and has had its day and it's been replaced by, by entrepreneurial method, ob observing the entrepreneurial method. And what we see is that entrepreneurs. As a quick little thing, you know, they focus on what they have. You know, they, they're means-based uh, business people. Rather than saying, I want to build the world's best mousetrap, they go and they say, you know what, here I am in Hacker Dojo. I'm, I'm a really good coder in, <laughs> give me a language. Python. I'm, I'm a really good coder in Python. I've got, um, I've got Lisa over here who's in a particular space and she can give me the industry content. And here, I've, here are the pieces of the puzzle I've got. Let's do something with that. So one of the features that defines the entrepreneurial method is means-based approach to business rather than goals-based approach to business. It's not the goal that's driving the behaviour, it's the means that are driving the behaviour. So once you understand that, you can encourage young entrepreneurs to actually uh, understand that what they have is really valuable, their own personal experience and what they've learnt and who they know and what their passion is, what drives them internally and that that's a unique strategic resource. That if they focus on that and run with it, gives them a better chance of success in the market. And that's entrepreneurial behavior. So that's the, that's the type of, of thing that we, talk with, that we teach to our <coughs> students. Yeah. Maybe that might, um, is, is, yeah? Yeah, there you go. And there's, yeah, there's five of those. I could, I could run a whole class here if you wish. <laughs> yeah. Cool, are we done? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Baden. Uh, what makes an entrepreneur? We have passion, we have perseverance, we have hunger. 
we also have the ability to break dance. Uh, <laughs> in the interest of having um, an elevator pitch where you can make an offer that the VC just cannot refuse, here is uh, how to do the wave. Yes. Ed. All right. So everyone's going to participate. Let's stand up, everybody. It's Friday. <laughs> One key thing is we're out of our comfort zone. That opens, that's what makes us strong entrepreneurs, right? Ah, so let's get loose. Let's get out of our comfort zone. Let's get out loose. All right. So we don't have any music, so I'm just going to take it step by step. There we go. Yes. All right. So you're going to have your hands up. Hands up, right? Nice and loose. Don't poke anybody. All right. You're going to go fingers, fists, wrists, elbow, shoulder. Now we'll just start on one side. Just say use your stronger side. We'll do it again. Now you got the, the basics of it. Fingers, fist, wrist, elbow, shoulder. And now that's what it looks like, the wave. Ladies and gentlemen, you are doing the wave. That's my 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Do we have any other 30 second announcements? If you have something to say, if you're looking for a co-founder, looking to hire anybody, looking for work, you can come up here and you have 30 seconds to make a pitch. We move on to our third speaker, uh, Jim, if you could set up these. So we have with us James today. Um, he started out working as a telephone, uh, telephone, telephone, telephone equipment ma uh, company and uh, it was called Optiphone. Right now he runs a business called Carlson Wireless. And what Carlson Wireless does is it makes radio equipment uh, for the purpose of repurposing TV frequency spectrums. James? Yes. Hello there. Thank you. Sophie? Just give me one minute to get this kind of going here. So how many of you folks are entrepreneurs? Just uh, trying to get an idea, huh? 80%? There's some of you who probably didn't raise your hands that are entrepreneurs, too. Um, well, you're meeting an entrepreneur that's been that way all of his life. When I got out of college, it's like, the next thing I did is said, how do I become self-employed? I don't know why, but it just got that going. So in 1980, um, we began a business that uh, manufactured equipment that um, would replicate the telephone service, but do it by wireless means and began selling that to companies like, uh, at that time, it was back in the U.S. West and other uh, older telepack Pacific Bell and things like this. And um, the object was to bring telephone services into areas that couldn't justify bringing the wires or didn't have the wires there. So there was a fair amount of the U.S. that didn't have phone service. State parks, I mean, we, we made a pretty good business out of that, and then globally it expanded, and we got into locations that were all around the world. Uh, in 1998, I sold that business to Zone Technologies, and um, was happy kind of with that exit for about a year, and then got the itch again to get back into uh, development. Uh, and this time, um, we began building uh, microwave equipment that would bring broadband services as well as telephone and eventually worked our way to the point where, in one second here, let me just get this going. Okay, so it's not doing everything I wanted to, but it's good enough for you guys to see. Um, so we, we began thinking about how, we, how could we get uh, portable broadband to this other 4 billion people in the world that don't have it? What could, what could we do to make it? It's, 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 the question was affordability. Right now, you wonder why in Africa has a uh, internet percentage rate of maybe 10 or 12 percent, and, and Asia has, you know, similar in India, for instance, maybe has 15 or 20 percent internet penetration. Why don't those other people have it? And it's the cost. I mean, mobile cell phones, it's a money-making proposition. The spectrum costs money. 
and um, you know the whole thing ends up being a you know fifteen twenty dollar a month type of a, an approach. Well, we thought, all right, if we were to take the TV spectrum, which is less and less people are watching TV, the occupancy in the U.S. is about eight percent. Um, of, the, of the spectrum is used, you know, to, on, the, on the television channels if you average it out throughout the whole U.S. But in other countries it can be even less, even 2 or 3 percent. So we said, well, that spectrum is being wasted. What can be done to make this more useful? We met with the FCC back in 2008 when they were converting to digital, and that digital conversion allowed the channels to become adjacently um, placed next to each other so the, the TV stations packed and left big white spaces out there in the uh, spectrum for television band. Um, and we said, okay, let's build a radio that would bring broadband services using that free spectrum, call it on license. And it was even ended up coined by um, uh, Google as a super, Larry Page called it super Wi-Fi because it had this three to five time um, you know, range over standard Wi-Fi. Um, so we, 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 we built the product, got it licensed by the FCC, and then began um, uh, selling and putting in demonstration equipment around the world. Let's see if we can get uh, uh, just a little bit of this PowerPoint going here. So I've already talked through most of this, but our company, you know, has, has been focused to, um, to bring rural communications for quite some time. And this, this seemed like a, a natural uh, thing. And, you know, when, when you see that the U.S. itself has 6 million households that didn't have internet, we just thought there'd be a good market for this. So we built the product, and um, we were demonstrating that the television band has so much better penetration and, op and operation over hills and places where microwave wouldn't work. Um, and it turns out that, you know, um, maybe 20% of the applications that are used by um, um, uh, internet service providers turn out to be non-line of sight or problematic for um, microwave, and the television band solved that problem. So in the U.S. we had something that was, pardon me, one minute? Oh, sorry. Well, anyways, we'll just speed it right along here and say, uh, we built this product, we got it out in the marketplace, and um, uh, it's now we're, we're going for a Series B round of uh, funding for it, and we're wanting to really get some traction in, um, in uh, Africa and in South Asia and uh, Latin America and places like this. So. All right. What exactly is being built? Is it a point to point? A uh, point to multi point products that maybe would serve 100 people from a base station. And each of them would get, you know, a five megabit uh, type of download or something. Uh, so, it's between the UE and the network, where the TV is running. Right. Okay. Exactly. Not for the number. It's for the the transmission from the the base station to the uh, to the UE. <coughs> Question. Uh, yeah. in, in most developing countries, the, the, the key problem is in the last. Right. Uh, uh, and so, uh, to, to address that, uh, uh, first question is how, how are you addressing that? And secondly, uh, who are you actually selling it to? Are you selling it to ISPs or are you selling it to the, uh, the, the local cities uh, or government? Um, sometimes it's NGOs that buy the product. The idea is to take the capital expenditure out of it and just turn it over to the community on, on an operating expense. So that's why the spectrum gets repurposed. It doesn't have to be resold like cell frequencies are. And, um, and so I ISPs are about 50% of our customers and, and communities or state-run institutions, NGOs are the other group. So we have products in um, all, all through Africa, demonstration uh, projects we did with Google and um, Microsoft, and we've got projects in you know, uh, in South Asia, and now we're working with India next. First question? Can it be used in established markets where we take things like Comcast? Well, um, Sorry. We, 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 we've, we've used it in, in locations that, um, that, that generally microwave is cheaper. 
So the ISP will use microwave first. Um, our goal is to get this Series B round where we'll make the product the same price as microwave by you know making it you know basic design for it. Another question? Pardon me? Oh. Generally, the um, end user, you know, would pay something in the range of five or, or uh, dollars a month, something like this, for data services, basic data services. Um, what, what, what our goal was is that in some areas they'll put in a hotspot, you know, you know, in, 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 in communities that will be free internet, and then um, businesses may pay. You know, to sort of pay that subsidized cost for higher speed performance. All right, one more question. Okay, so I'm absolutely not a radio wave expert, and that might come out in this question, but I've been reading about um, a lot of sort of preemptive legislation in America at the state level to um, kind of basically against any nonprofit or public utility getting into the business of providing internet, and I'm, I'm basically wondering if there's any inter interaction between your products and the regulations or does it apply? Well, there's, there's uh, wireless internet service providers that aren't regulated, and they're able to do things, but they just don't get any state funding or any federal funding. And then there's the telcos who get federal funding. In fact, in this last two weeks, six billion dollars has been passed out from this, what they call Connect America Fund, to six of the telephone companies in the U.S. large rural telephone providers. So um, they, they are getting monies to put in fiber and wireless services into these six million households that aren't being served. And we're hoping to be a major customer of that. Okay. How does your technology compare with respect to technology for about 700 megahertz uh, or the cascades of deploying for large scale uh, coverage? Well, we're running in the UHF and VHF frequencies, so they'll be in the, the um, 170 to 200 megahertz and 470 to 700 megahertz. So it's a lower frequency, it provides better coverage and penetration. And uh, the products optimized for that service. Now, the 700 megahertz that exists in the U.S. is is um, mostly now um, used for the cell phone companies. Carriers have bought most of it, so it's it's not going to be real cheap. It's it's a money play. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our fourth presenter has a bio bit um, he's written. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good... Oh, wait, these are my notes. <laughs> Hamilton loves startups. He was an early employee of Open Wave, which web enabled over 1 billion feature phones. He was also a co-founder and CEO of a machine learning startup that productized support vector machines. There he worked with professors from Stanford and Cornell, received a grant from the National Science, uh, Science Foundation, published his research with Novartis and was granted a patent. Tonight he will tell us about his latest startup that he has been working for the last year. Hamilton. Thank you, Sophie. I have a teenage daughter and her favorite activity is using her smartphone to message her friends. Messaging isn't just text anymore, it's photos. That's why Instagram and Snapchat are so popular because young folks are having conversations with photos. It's so popular, over 100 million daily active users on Snapchat alone. So when I decided to do my next startup, I chose to create better looking photo messages. And specifically, to develop an algorithm which hadn't been developed to find the best location and color for text on a photo. So you're probably wondering what that looks like. I'm going to give you a few examples here. Every one of these photos, the text was located and colored by an algorithm. This is definitely a problem where a computer can do a more a superior job of optimization than a human. 
one of the things I tried to understand is why these photos uh, made such a strong impression. And so I did a little bit of research, and my current hypothesis is based on the Gestalt principles of proximity and continuity. Specifically, because you have that text on the photo in a location that's non-obtrusive with any of the major features, and it's in a color that is harmonious with the photo, your mind treats it as a single entity. So while the right side of your brain is processing the image, the left side is processing the text. And that results in a more memorable and impactful experience. I'm just going to give you a few other examples. You can use this for, while well, I created this for photo messaging, you can use this app for many more things such as memes, if you want to create a birthday cards, if you want to do a slides, you can use it for that. Um, if you just want to use it as a graphic artist, I was demoing it in the break room and a graphic artist was really nice. She said, you just did in seconds what it would take me 20 minutes to do. Uh, so I appreciate that compliment. Uh, it also supports many languages, such as Japanese, Chinese, Korean, any of the European languages. And this is uh, created by my daughter. You can see she's a better photographer than I am. This problem turned out to be much harder than I expected to do, which is why I've been at this for about a year now. And when I finished, I filed a fairly broad and deep patent on this technology. But tech isn't enough. You need an application that is enjoyable and fun to use. So I also spent a lot of time optimizing the user experience based on what users were tell telling me uh, when they let me see if I can get full screen, when they actually uh, use this. And now I'm going to do a live demo, which is always a little exciting. But Sophie, you can hold this because I'm sure. okay. don't want to trip while I'm doing the demo. So I'm going to start up the Magic Text application. You can either take a photo, sort of like Snapchat, or choose one from your gallery. I'm going to choose a fun one. And uh, if you're a cat lover, I apologize in advance. But I'm going to type a little message here. Now, it's automatically going to find the best location and color for that text. You notice it didn't put it over either the puppy, the kitty, or the flowers. It found a nice location that not only is easy to read, but it brought out the color, and it gives you the runner-up choices. So for example, if I wanted to do purple, I could optimize for that, or green. It gives you a lot of choices. It also lets you choose from any color in the color spectrum. However, uh, all the colors it shows you are clearly readable by folks with every major form of color blindness. Um, in addition, when you move it, it will automatically update the color for the best color for that exact location. So not only is it harmonious with the photo, but it's good for that. Uh, you can directly manipulate the text as well. And let me uh, just adjust it. Now, if you're into photo messaging, this font is just not that cool. So I could use a fancy font, but I like these all caps fonts, so I'm going to do that. And since we were just talking about Snapchat, I'm going to use Snapchat and crop that poor kitty out because dogs rule. So <laughs> if we, uh, Bring it down a little, and then we're going to share it with Snapchat. It fits perfectly in Snapchat because it's using a <coughs> Snapchat cropping preset. Uh, so that's the that's a demo. I demo the product. It's up, but it is available on the App Store. I just oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, I just released it on the App Store, uh, so it's available to download for free with no advertising or in-app purchases and strong privacy protection. So if you think it looks cool or you want to help me out, uh, please consider downloading it. If you have feedback, uh, you can talk, talk to me. Or I have an Instabug library installed, so you can just shake the phone after you complete the tutorial, and it'll prompt you to send me feedback directly. I'm just a single guy bootstrapping this uh, startup, so uh, I'm trying to do a marketing, fledgling marketing campaign. But um, So if you like it, uh, please consider giving it five stars and a nice review. That would really help me out. And one other thing, uh, I'd like to list this on Product Hunt. I think it's a pretty unique and innovative app, but I need an invite from someone who's on Product Hunt who uh, can give an invite so I can list my product. So if you have that, please talk to me afterwards. I'd really appreciate your help. 
Uh, thank you very much. So you have a question. Yes. And by the way, I'm still having trouble with you. Oh, so yeah, we can actually go slower. <laughs> we can do the whole thing. Yeah, fantastic. Sorry, I thought I was going to rush that. Have you thought about monetization? Because you brought up a good example. The graphic artist, you just saved the time. Yeah, well, I did, a, I, I did an enterprise startup, but we wouldn't let anyone into the beta who didn't pay us money. But this is a consumer app. Okay. And one of the things you want to consider with a consumer app is, is the money you're going to make from consumers worth it? My personal opinion for this app is it's not. You look at Instagram, a billion dollars. WhatsApp, 19 billion. Snapchat's currently 15 billion. None of them are making any money off the user. I think WhatsApp made 12 and a half million. So unless you have millions of users, you're not going to effectively be able to monetize users. And there was one other thing. I wanted to create the best experience possible. And when I look at the app store reviews, a lot of the apps where you can do this without automation, just manually put text on. People were complaining about the ads and the in-app purchases and the watermarks. So I really optimize on maximizing user experience. So that's why I was kind of just trying to change yeah. the focus on user. If maybe designers, you save them time, this could be a plug into the tool they use today. Oh, I, I absolutely agree, and I actually took features out of this app when I was user testing it. Uh, because if you have too many fe features, it's confusing for the user. So I could in the future, for example, do a pro version for somebody like a designer who needs a higher level of control. But it's just too overwhelming for somebody who's going into this app because there's a number of things you can do. For example, I didn't show you, but you can tab and see the follow-up locations, optimal locations on the photo besides the first one that are also really good for the text. Um, so yeah, I could certainly do a pro version. That's not going to make a lot of money, right. but it, it could pay a few bills. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes? I think it would be super cool. Uh, technically, yes, dogs do rule. Yes, uh, thanks. <laughs> Third, uh, have you, uh, does the algorithm extend to video as well? And have you considered how that would uh, work with video or? The out, well, let's, let's put it this way. The algorithm will work with each frame of the video. Um, so you could, you know, I could think of some simple optimizations, but that is, um, that's more like a Google style op where you need some pretty, pretty heavy computing. I, one other thing I'd like to point out for the, the tech folks here, we've moved from a thin client to a fat client. You have a very powerful computer in your hand. My last company, I, we were spending over 100000 a month on EC2. The entire app runs in an iPhone, and it'll actually perform quite well on an iPhone 4. So, you know, we have the ability to uh, distribute our computing across iPhones instead of just on the server side as well. So I think that's kind of an interesting uh, thing as well. Any other questions? Yes? Did you do the, the, uh, build the program yourself? Yeah, well, I had to do, some, I had to do a lot of research. For the first three months, I wasn't even sure it was doable. Because my goal was to get high quality results for any photo. And it's one thing to sit there with your three or four photos and get it to work. But to have it work, you know, especially when you're doing automation, you really want, you don't want 70% accuracy, you want 99% uh, you know, high quality results. And so I spent a lot of time doing it. Android, uh, uh, it's currently on iPhone, but it, okay. it would be straightforward to it. Yes. So there's a two-tier architecture, and uh, I assume you, you are using uh, MongoDB as database? Actually, there's no server component in that. And I did that for strategic reasons. I was originally planning on writing it as a back-end service in Java. The reason I didn't is because if you want to maximize the user experience, one of the problems with apps is you have network holes where you're going to have bad connectivity, and so you're going to have a poor user experience. That's why messaging Six of the top ten apps used globally are messaging apps for mobile. People are using messaging as the, the top app on the phone because it's more asynchronous. And so I wanted to preserve maximum experience. So, so it's uh, like a one tier only running locally? Low it, it only runs in, yeah. Even no peer to peer communication communicating with other phones? No. No, nothing. No. No, no, no. I could have written it, but I just thought it was a better experience. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Why the name the Magic Test? Uh, so nobody gets the name. I thought it was so cool when I did, so I'm going to explain it. So I wanted something that had image and text. I used to work at General Magic once upon a day. 
Um, and I love that name. And so I wanted to have magic because you have an image and you, put, you do some magic to put the text on it. But uh, in hindsight, eh, nobody gets it. <laughs> yeah. And also the other thing is it's really hard to find domain names. It's actually what wasn't it. Any other questions? Yes? Would you like to transfer your this idea to um, it is doable. I haven't done it yet. Uh, any other questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Hamilton. Uh, we are wrapping up the lightning talks. Did you have a good evening? Yes. Okay, great. Um, have a great evening ahead. Good weekend. If you're going to Burning Man, uh, I believe there are a ton of bugs. Please take pictures and put them on Facebook, especially after you're drunk. <laughs> Live long and prosper, people. Have a great weekend. Take care.